Hello everyone, today a hopefully brief, but when it gets to the Franks, nothing can be brief, um, a reflection on the mm, enormous importance of Clovis' baptism, and in fact the conversion of the Frankish people, albeit imperfectly, but this is the most important thing, uh, directly from paganism to Catholicism, skipping Arianism. And when I talk uh, these topics, I realize that I should start even uh, about making even some kind of biographies about figures like Clovis in the first place, but many others. I mean, Clovis' importance is definitely overlooked in some in some regard, right? You know, you think about Constantine, and you realize that he changed the world, and created an entire universe in, in a sense. When it gets to to what was at least at the beginning of his uh, reign a very modest chieftain with no more than uh, half a thousand men uh, under his command uh, figured like like Clovis you realize that this person in impacted um, the world in ways that are difficult even to, to recollect because not just because you know we can banally say in the longer run the Byzantine Empire and that the Orthodox world kind of shrank in front of the West. In fact, it was the West that made this lion's share of the entire, in fact, what we call broadly speaking, uh, in the sense narrowly speaking, Western civilization in, a, in the boom that exactly from areas like, like France, like uh, the Netherlands, um, Clovis can be considered linguistically an old Dutch in, in a way, as the, the Carolingians were instead uh, high Germans by, by a certain degree. Um, in any case, you realize that the the influence of this man was was something incredible, and it's not much about him alone, of course, but of course the context and this broader dynamics that especially revolving around ecclesiastical policy that was all one with Clovis' political and military action, at least took a while to take that shape that exactly has his dominion and that's directly proportional in fact as a dynamic um, the world was changed forever uh, in ways that in fact are sometimes dismissed because you know there's been uh, can kind of a anti-nationalistic uh, reaction which to a certain extent is perfectly fine as nationalism is actually an anti-traditional ideology and viciously so but uh, coming to 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 deny the, the world package and including in fact again the traditional one given that that was the op not even the opposite at least on the political the classical political spectrum was mostly marxist structuralist uh, historiography but basically nationalism and socialism are essentially tending towards the same absolute extreme that is anti-traditional and um, that effectively there, there was a connection between Clovis, the Frankish kingdom, as he established, because before the Franks were just some different kingdoms fundamentally, and they, they didn't even think to unite, at least especially the way Clovis did. Um, and the later uh, in fact, the same Carolingian Empire, the same, eventually, the French kingdom and modern France by a certain degree. And people say, ah, oh, Schwerpunkt, you know very well that Clovis was a German, fundamentally. And there is a debate about, you know, there were, I don't know, politicians quarreling about, you know, was Clovis French or German? Well, in terms of nas modern nationalities, this doesn't actually make any sense because at the time there was nor France nor Germany and to think of any of them is, is foolishness but at the same time um, the, the the political continuity between probably the Merovingian dynasty and that's why mostly people from both sides of the aisle ha have kind of missed the point um, both from a nationalist and socialist perspective so essentially extreme ideologies that were born out of the destruction of tradition and surprise surprise from the same places with the French Revolution in great part which was, was not the only place where this happened but as you know in Europe uh, this modernizing secularizing force had paradoxically started with the same France but for reasons that 
do not do not have to be connected uh, directly and intentionally with in fact what St. Clovis started in a way. We're talking about a biological dynasty ruling in fact what was meant to be a universal empire. That is to say everything we lack uh, today it's not much about the biological continuity, it's, it's about properly the realization that power is one and that the faculty of command has to properly be embodied by someone. Right? And, and of course connecting some other traditional values that did have to do also with the biological continuity that as you know in the Merovingian world was uh, radically uh, obstance and emphasized probably a matter of blood now one today we're probably going to touch different topics so the, the video is not going to be short at all in spite of the expectations but one that will come back on is the comparison between Spain and Gaul in this process because you would wonder but why didn't for example the Visigoths succeed in the same fashion the Franks did mm. it's not much just about the the Islamic conquest or maybe it's it, it is about that but just as a uh, flipping the question because that was just the consequence of a Visigothic weakness by the beginning of the 8th century that you can find among the Franks if you consider especially the dynastic aspect that it was not much of a Visigothic problem instead so things are complex and comparisons have to be made carefully but as we have explained multiple times in the videos about the migration here and the settlement of the Germanic peoples in what was previously the, the Western Roman Empire um, the uh, these two regions shared a lot, uh, especially in terms of uh, wealth distribution, and more concretely, the continuity. In fact, with the Roman, uh, with the Roman administration, as opposed to other areas of Europe, including Italy, but even Britain, for example. So even very distant, once again, you, know, you can't draw easy equations through that simply as a, as a dynamic um, had lost so great part of Frankish and also with the initial Visigothic power were rooted in the massive estates that had remained importantly intact in these two vaste regions in Western Europe mm -hmm. um, two regions that were also some of the most dramatically Romanized in the entire empire, right? And they were probably the largest, most I mean, Gaul altogether, even though it was a, a complex thing from an ethnic point of view, not differently from the Iberian Peninsula, was factually at the time of Clovis the richest, like in, in absolute terms, probably in the quantity of resources, richest country in Western Europe. And when the Franks began, and, and this is Again, the Franks had settled gradually within the Roman Empire and really gradually at essentially the, um, the withdrawal of Roman presence along the Rhine that also were kind of depopulated areas that the Romans simply said, okay, let's give it up because it's simply not convenient anymore. Um, and they had other problems, by the way, to cope with and the Franks... Um, had served in this sense, it's not they liked the Romans more than others, they were terrible, uh, you know, Roman lovers, actually the saint, there was always a great deal, deal of, um, of conflictuality within the same peoples about the broader international line that they had to follow, and Clovis, this, is quite an interesting figure, also looking at his Origins, because these people, at the, uh, the elites, were all mixed, were all international. He was half Frankish, half Thuringian. If he would marry a Visigothic princess, um, his sister was married to Theodoric. I mean, this is the, the degree of. In fact, we have to understand the importance of the stocks of lineages over peoples. Right again, uh, studying history uh, in the re republican democratic bias that we have. In fact, after from after the Enlightenment is historically incorrect because it has nothing to do with how people thought at that time. These people were overwhelmingly obsessed about leadership and individuality, 
right? And uh, that is to say, they thought they were se demi heroes, right? Ruling over the world entire uh, as a uh, normal objective. This is basically the, the cultural rise in the, in, in the Franks, or I'd better say, in the sense of the Merovingians, are the best example of how the largest power in Europe was created by the complete annihilation say, of any kind of resistance to this uh, idea that is highly aristocratic in nature and that brought to the literal beha beheading of all the other Frankish chieftains to make Clovis and his family rule again on the most powerful uh, entity in Europe and the Franks simply adapted to it as a people entirely. Um, in any case um, the thing is complex because naturally uh, it took a lot of strength and a lot of capacity that was recognized in this to, to take out the various uh, the Frankish uh, the other Frankish chieftains and as we will see now we're looking at our reality was increasingly more Gallo-Roman than than actually Frankish in, in practice even if some picture that I've posted here some map shows dramatically well in terms of Merovingian administration, how essentially the northeastern Germanic part was kind of left a bit out of the games, right? The, the effect of the big, the big money, the, the, the major political, military, and social establishment was carried out by Clovis in Gaul, in a properly Gallic reality, in the Romanized areas with the local episcopal senatorial elites, right? And that's where the power came from. Because let's be honest, this was a late Roman imperial model and it, in this sense the, the basis of Merovingian power had to be understood definitely in that one that again was highly aristocratic the same had been in in Spain in a way or better we should say in Aquitaine first and then the Iberian Peninsula where the Visigoths had settled as you know since the 5th century and that uh, you know they they as gold they would, would lose exactly under Frankish pressure. Definitely in Gaul, uh, the Visigothic expulsion, especially considering at that time the Visigoths were Aryans, simplified, first of all, the ecclesiastical problem, because Gaul was heavily, again, Romanized, Christianized, were Catholic, and so these Aryans, I, I made a video about that, uh, actually, it's titled Visigothic Kings and Aquitanian Population, something like that, uh, also made more recently another video about Caesarius um, of Arles uh, which uh, deals with this kind of in fact Visigothic Gallic dimension that was a bit trouble and never kind of very stable and in fact would have been largely lost except for Gothia you know, at some kind of Visigothic tail strike but um, the in in, um, in in Spain eventually the Visigothic kingdom you know, shift towards Toledo, etc., would became the capital. But at the same time, as you know, the the seat of the of the famous councils that were essentially an expression of the Romano-Iberian Visigothic nobility that operated in that sense ag uh, against a restriction of royal power. The Visigothic kings did not uh, buy immediately the Catholic Romanic uh, the, the, the Roman Catholic order and this brought probably to a fatal reversal of political balance because they didn't accept to rule immediately with uh, on the base of the local of the local aristocracies that again had not really gone destroyed in spite of the virus vandal Alan ravages etc um, and that the the Visigoth um, monarchy for, for for a long time kind of was suspicious of, right? It was not much. It's not that they cared about even the religious issue so much. Uh, it, it it was just a matter of who had in theory to rule as a as a broader establishment, and also on the base of the international um, situation. Of course, the Visigothic kings at that point enjoyed still kind of a nam namely um, control. On the uh, on their on their nobility, the um, the Franks had a different story. First of all, the Visigoths migrated uh, as an entire people, right, with without literally sh uh, the being displaced, right, and migrating 
um, as, a, as an entire unit that in that sense was also importantly compacted by Roman engineering, political engineering and cultural assimilation because they were factually the most Romanized of all the Germans. And so this would have, you would have thought would have brought to the to to an easier assimilation among uh, some other you know imperial populations. It said this didn't happen because they st the, exactly pr probably because they were more compact because um, the Romans had made of Alaric this figure of a single monarch that probably all, all the other coming after would would take as 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 an example because again. That this had never existed among the Germans. It was considered kind of an affront to the uh, egalitarian, read oligarchic um, order of their of their community. And 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 yet this this cohesion probably brought the Visigoths to kind of maintain it, also in front of the religious issue. And those would say uh, the the matter of whom had to properly control the estates that they found in the rest uh, of, of, of these areas. Um, this is important because you find it even among the Ostrogoths or even among the Vandals. I mean, these peoples arrived, the Goths are the best examples because we're, in any case, ruling on Roman behalf. Um, and, and there was an, a, an actual share between the, the military that was Germanic and the administration it was Roman so these two systems cooperated and that's where the the uh, Catholic Aryan attrition took form practically because um, again it was not much a matter of belief it was just saying from the Germanic side in theory here we we're s it's still kind of an unstable situation we don't know where will where this will go we are Aryans because yes we are Romanized but we want to remain kind of independent and to act in theory as kind of very autonomous people so we will not give up this this order of things would not share as uh, aristocracies with the rest of kind of the Roman ones uh, which would actually still happen because there's Moses and also in the Visigothic case would be even uh, on the longer run because all these peoples at the end of the day were you know simply from a demographic point of view they couldn't resist assimilation were just um, a few at most which is not even you know that was in the largest cases like the Ostrogoths or the Longbirds hundreds of thousands in populations of millions right so uh, there was no way uh, anything could and simply it was just that, that their costume, their customs were different, were more primitive, were suited to kind of more um, to wilder realities. Uh, also, they had kept living like in the mo more barbarized frontiers of the Balkans or other areas, but not in places like like Gaul, like Italy, like Spain, like Africa that were really something, um, especially at that point, entirely functional in a late antique uh fashion so on the longer run what what really happened is that with within the visigothic nobility uh, there was a split towards let's say those who in fact sided with the still the assimilation with the the episcopal senatorial elite it was basically i mean the roman catholic one was one thing altogether and the kind of aryan germanic ideal that came to be ever more like the uh, the monarchic one, right? The one that, in that sense, hoped to impose some kind of absolute and more um, and great and more centralized control. But this couldn't happen if you lost the the support, in fact, of the majority of the same oligarchs, whether they were Germans mixing with with the Romans or simply the latter. And that's how the Visigothic kingdom, albeit being very powerful, it's in, in being able in also in the Iberian Peninsula for generations to wage an important amount of of of, uh, of campaigns that, but just by number and range, were really impressive. They're really similar to the in fact to the Merovingian ones in Gaul. At the end of the day, the monarchy shrank dramatically to just Toledo and basically the the surrounding few tens of of kilometers. While the entire land was factually ruled, aside from the fringe groups like I don't know the Suebi, the the Celtic North, and whatever, um, in a kind of a feudal 
uh, anarchy of some sort. I mean, actually, if you look before the Islamic conquest, Spain was transitioning towards something kind of more institutionalized, but so but it was so deeply soaked into privatization that, it, that there was no capacity from the kings to effectively maintain any control. There, there, there were... Um, and there were areas that were just different, even within the same country. I mean, think about the Ebro uh, Valley. Th those were more Romanized. They were kind of closer to, to Gaul, to Provence, even to Italy than, than the Iberian Peninsula. It's just a struggle that would, would go on later on between Castilla and, and Aragon, right? Um, uh, there were the uh, those other French communities, as we've seen, that were never fully brought under, nor the, you know, the, uh, the Muslims. Um, would achieve uh, the same uh, the same objective. So um, it was a very complicated scenario, and great part of this had it can be imputed objectively to the missed integration of the Visigothic and the Roman Church that eventually occurred, as you know, from the late sixth, the beginning of seventh century. The Visigoths became Catholic. But the damage was done at that point. It was there hadn't been a unity at the beginning, and this had effectively screwed up the political and institutional stability of the land. What happened with Clovis and Gaul instead is a completely different thing, because this all this problem of Arianism, etc., did not happen. It was completely skipped, and um, there were naturally some reasons why. Right, this is not just. Clovis' decision, but of course he comforted that, and in the man, the struggle was evident because he didn't even want to convert to Christianity, <laughs> right? You know, he was interested in, in Arianism himself at the beginning. He also had married, as we were saying before, a Visigothic princess who also cared very much about um, having their children baptized, and in fact, two sons initially uh, being born uh, were baptized secretly by their mother and they both died so also confirming Clovis um, adversion uh, against uh, Christianization at the beginning and the reason why the Franks were, were so objectively brutally and violently minded which is something that they were dramatically able to channel in their own political and military ambition is that of course they, they had had a very different story from from the one of the gods uh, it's kind of weird. Many people think that the Franks, you know, passed, in fact, from from paganism to Catholicism straight away because they were more Romanized. What? The, the Franks more Romanized? The most Romanized were exactly the gods. And exactly because they were more Romanized, they were more culturally resistant, uh, and they created that fracture that we've seen before. The Franks were something else. The Franks had literally come out of the forest the day before. They were not Romanized at all. The fact that they were close... To, to the empire for, for centuries. These were essentially the, the, the descendants, more or less, of the same tribes that had participated largely to, to the um, Teutoburg uprising back in the day. In spite of the proximity, and this is just to, to reveal how what Germany really was, they, they hadn't assimilated to Rome because they just were, as you know, the, the western, the northwestern Germans were kind of some of the most uh, more primitive, least developed, like the big confederacies were the ones in the east, like this, this, this Swabian one, then eventually these uh, eastern Germans that um, went, in fact, uh, further east and they kind of uh, mixed with the Sarmatians and got this kind of more step mindset for which there was a greater hierarchy, etc. I mean, if you look at the northern Germans and the, the western Germans, those kind of the more the, the wilder, the, the ones that kind of also maintain a more primigenial traditional um, idea of their military lifestyle and war likeness. And that's, in fact, why the Franks were so so bloodthirsty in many ways. I mean, even the Elb Germans, like the Alemanni, the, they weren't that different from the Franks. Actually, they were pretty much the same. But uh, later on, also somebody w went more west, like the Longbirds, etc. Those were also a bit more step-like, right? The, the Hunnic uh, experience, I would say, uh, was was something really, um, as you know, instead the, the Visigoths, the Franks were more, the Burgundians were more like, even though barely, because they, they also were kind of split, they sent war bands around everywhere, kind of had kind of more fit the, the, the Roman domination dur uh, during the arrival of Attila and the establishment of the Hunnic Empire. 
we made several videos about this, you know, they're the ones you watch the most, so I don't need to re-promote them every time. Um, but uh, in other words, for, for this very reason, they the Franks were also pagan, right? Of course, there was some Christian among them. Um, and of course, there were some other, you know, influences that you can easily see since uh, the, the Germans had always been kind of interested in what was going on in Roman Gaul. They, they would take some, I don't know, oriental uh, deities that were the, the Romans had imported in, in, in Gaul at the frontier with, with Germany and they kind of began to worship them. I mean, there are these kinds of, uh, of connections, but practically that was the, the, the completely pagan mindset for which whatever you can bring in in terms of, um, of spiritual forces, the better it was. And of course, uh, the Franks were exposed at this point by the end of, of the 5th century to the broader temper of Christianity. Uh, they were toying with that. Clovis and his family, uh, talking about his, the paternal side, the male line, um, were fundamentally Roman generals. This is what historiography is showing us, that these were, in fact, um, all different chieftains of the, the various Frankish tribes that had gradually been settled in this area, of, you know, close to, essentially, the, in the, on the North Sea, um, and uh, along the, the Rhine, and all towards, Clovis was born in Tournai, so we're talking about the, the, the southern Netherlands today, and the Toxander, some, it was an extended area, where the Romans, as we were saying in the beginning, had settled the Franks to, to act as a buffer state against other Germans, which, you know, they had also kind of you know, at least stuck to as as a general line because, for example, in 406, when the when it was the major uh, breakthrough, the Rhine of the the Vandals, the Burgundians, etc. The the Franks tried to stop them because you know they had settled from the Roman side. They said, you know, that that's our land now. Let's, let's try to avoid this this avalanche, and that's instead what uh, you know it failed. But at least they tried, and that's also at that point where everybody was swarming to go. Said, you know. Well, okay, let's join them too. <laughs> they, they took some some piece of land, but actually the Roman administration there had remained under Regidius, um, under Siagrius, even after the formal uh, coming back of the imperial insignia to Constantinople, so the, the famed 476, whereas if you look at Siagrius, Nepos, etc., actually the Western Roman Empire went on for, for some time more. Um, and uh, the genealogy of Clovis is a bit complex. We know his father Kilderic, as a historical figure, his brother, uh, his um, you know more important ancestor should have been this mythical Merovec that literally means a uh, sea cow, and is connected to the to the idea of uh, the deity coming from the waters. It's connected. You would be surprised with the myth of Atlantis, with the origins of the. Um, you know the stock of rulers in in in, uh, in the world it was present as a reminiscence in in the Germanic mindset, and so that already shows the ambitions of these uh, chieftains to assess, as it was typical for the Germanic nobility, this this um, uh, in fact semi-divine status to justify their emergence over over the freemen in their military fashion, and we understand that. We don't know about Merovec. He might have been actually the Frankish leader um, under the under Essius at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, right? Of course, from the Roman side against the Huns, um, and they were responding to the Magister Militum of Gaul. So factually, they were part of the Roman army, and they reasoned as Roman generals. Uh, in at the time of uh, the Sun King in the 17th century or later, I don't remember was maybe Louis the 15th, I, I don't remember, uh, in the 17th and 18th century, th there was even a discovery, I don't remember whose tomb there was that, I think it was found, this was a Frankish chieftain that actually had Roman insignia in his tomb, right, uh, it was fantastic, like this was fundamentally a Roman general, but he was a Frankish leader too, right, also the bees were from all these, um, this broader, Simple. You you can't just be fascinated. This stuff went destroyed, I think, because of the f the, the the terrible accomplishments of the French Revolution, at least in its uh, in its oeuvres um, side. And 
Um, and yet th this manifests how close at least the the leaders were in participating to the Roman administration, how close they were in fact to the understanding of Roman goal and, and what their elites were about. These were terribly warlike people as we were saying before and these leaders also understood that taking over Roman goal, especially taking out the, the, the last essentially fact part of, of Roman a Roman army that they were the same ones they were fighting for um, and they had its center in Soissons uh, famously enough that would be in fact the seat of the battle in which Siagris was defeated by Clovis and, and other Frankish chieftains it also would become an important center in Merovingian goal um, was literally opening the Franks there, they were factually the only force uh, except the Alamanni, in fact, against which they had to fight and the, the, the Visigoths and the Burgundian that however were fundamentally in the, in the south, right, so in, in northern Gaul, in this area that was Belgica fundamentally, that would become Neustria plus those parts of, of Austrasia in the northeast it's Frankish lands, that again the Franks were not even a unitary thing, they were the Salians, the Ripuarians as you know um, but would simply confer to these initially relatively, uh, you know, modest chieftains the control over an enormous amount of people of land. And the only way to achieve this, given that, as we were saying before, the Visigoths had migrated like a, a, as a cohesive people and already, in fact, as an army of, of, of the Illyricum. That's what the, the Visigothic kings were. They, they were uh, Magistri Militum, Peri Lyricum, on behalf of the Roman emperors. We made a video just recently about, in fact, the rise of Alaric and the Theodosian policy, etc. Um, they were instead something else. The Franks were just the scattered tribes that gradually moved in and di didn't have a previous cohesion. So to hope to unify those in a broader sense would have been kind of a waste of time because it was all warlike tribes that would have simply said nuts, right? And it would have taken ages just to hope and it would have been an enormous risk it would have pro surely failed to take them out just to compact them and then invading gold the, the key thing was yes taking out some of them but in order to reinforce their control on gold on the roman area which was crucial and in order to do that too because the area was huge it, it is true that its army was uh, the one of Siagris was kind of the only Roman army that was there, but there were lots of other cities and communities and also military uh, units that would eventually be integrated in the Merovingian army and would be revered. In fact, also their descendants bore for, for generations this idea that they, they were formerly Roman legionnaires, um, were controllable only w w through a pact with the Gallo-Roman elites that were fully Catholic, were some of the most fully Catholic people in, in the entirety of uh, the Roman Empire, you know, what remained of it at that point. So, just by obvious practicality, the easiest way for asserting an enormous power on the region and essentially rising as the sole ruler of the same was to accept the compromise of Christianization and also skipping the useless uh, uh, impediment of Arianism that in this situation didn't really have much to you know to offer especially to the Franks because um, the, the 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 Visigoths against that still ruled in Aquitaine, south of the Loire, so that would have been surely the next door uh, enemies right, quite soon had the, uh, in fact, the Franks consolidated their rule in, in Belgica, that were also allied with, with Theodoric, with the Ostrogoths, who were by far the greatest power in Western Europe uh, at the time, were Aryans, right? And Aryans were, or let's say better, pro-Aryan or pro or, or better, as we will see now, now anti-Frankish, anti-Merovingian at least, were all those pagan peoples 
of Central Europe, like the Thuringians, the Longbirds, uh, the, the same Alamanni, that didn't want to see um, a revival of the, of the Roman Empire in the West that would have brought to a further Catholicization and, Christian, uh, and, and Romanization, and that, in this sense, the bulwark of the Gothic axis in Spain and Italy was preserving. So Clovis had this great intuition for which uh, that he knew very well what this whole thing was about um, because his mother was Turingian and the Turingi, we made a video about them, were some of the, of the fiercest uh, pagan reactionaries, let's say, in, in Europe at the time, right? They, they were less politically cohesive than the Franks, even though they, they didn't care about religion either. It's just they feared the Franks. They feared this people that was already kind of making business with the Romans, that was looking at this expansion in Gaul, and that, um, you know, they, they, they feared because they were just next door. A bit like that were the Alamanni, that had been traditionally opposed to the Romans, had uh, fought and tried to invade Gaul, however, in turn, their own way, now saw the Franks as important competitors. Uh, so the situation goal had to be settled. The Turingi, the tr Im Im imagine to have a mother who comes from the hardest stock of pagan traditionalism, right? And a father that comes uh, from the hardest stock of pro-Roman uh, policy. And in that regard, you, you are torn apart also on the religious issue. Um, also, it would be very interesting to get in the mindset of a 5th, 6th century Frankish shift and just to, to, to discover a universe that it would, it would be too beautiful just to, to acknowledge per se, um, is from a historical point of view. But the, the, there were deep concerns that we can reconstruct even up to a certain point regarding what it would have meant to make this bond, to change the customs of of your own people and probably seeing another way of ruling that needed a compromise however with somebody right the the utmost ideal was being the strongest ever to conquer everybody yes but this doesn't happen much you know it's happened just in in, in the midst right in practice you have to show that that power manifests itself uh, and at that point you have to be able to, to just do it Clovis forced some chieftains uh, to, I don't know, kill their own fathers and then sent um, Sicarius to kill them in turn, just to to have this extor force of extortion of, 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 of authority. Uh, some When this thing had happened, also he he said, you know, Clovis, you sent this this assassin to it, and he said, I didn't do anything, he was making a, a cruise on, on the Rhine, which was doing, which to to distract um, the attention and, and responsibility. Um, suspicions, etc., um, and kind of bending so much this 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 war reality to his own purpose that he was really a master in this regard, and also with, with Iron Fist because objectively he managed to show in battle to 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 be loaded with the Imperium, to be loaded with the divine glory of the skies. Hell, this guy defeated everybody, practically. He, de he defeated the last Romans, he defeated um, the, the Alamanni at Tolpiac, the, the Visigoths at Vouye, uh, the Burgundians, the Turingi, right? And that's why, as we were saying before, they, you know, he, there was the stock, was the leader, was not, you know, w which people altogether. That was a, a, a clash among clans, terribly unruly um, uh, war bands that, that had that understood just one language that was the language of violence right so you had to show this power and at that point he would essentially negotiate with the gallo-roman elite the control over Gaul. initially he even raided roman Gaul before converting then as you know this conversion happened a bit like uh, constantine's in this moment of of peril uh, the Roman Emperor at the Milvian Bridge, Clovis at the Battle of Tolpiac against the Alamanni. The story goes, it's a bit, a lot of, a lot of myths, but they're quite eloquent, especially, as you know, Gregory of Tours, uh, basically the greatest Western author 
um, in the in the early Middle Ages um, as a Gallo-Roman uh, product of the best uh, Gallo-Roman tradition culture that describes Clovis uh, life in very positive terms opposing to the one of his successors by the way because the, as you know the, the Frankish practice was to split the inheritance among the male sons and so at every generation it would fragment the, the and the thing what went on and on and on through the Merovingian times, Carolingian times, it took centuries, like half of a millennium before it stopped. And and Gregory tells us many stories that of course are a bit a myth, but as you know, myth always has some pinch of truth in it. And of course the Battle of Tolbiac, the fact that the Alamanni were quite quite tough warriors very compact people and uh, in battle they, they showed that the Franks were about to be defeated so in in the heat of battle so in this moment that is very mystical and in the uh, in the broader universal religion of the time the moment in which the uh, the the hero literally transfigures um, in the moment of greatest danger in the holy war of in the uh, the European uh, world um, makes a deal with God and says if you you know, if you let me win, I will convert to Christianity. And and so, of course, this deal is made. God grants victory to Clovis. Of course, what happened at Tolbiac, we don't, we don't really know. But we can imagine that that was a crucial moment that also would bring into, if not the, the complete destruction of the Alamanni, but fundamentally their significant crippling and also their migration in fact towards more the the alpine uh, highlands um, where Theodoric actually uh, gave them refuge as kind of a military colony to protect Italy better from this growing Frankish power. Um, the Franks in fact were kind of the only major power in, in, in northern Gaul at that point for, for the land to be taken and, and uh, a government to, to be established and uh, probably in that battle there was a major you know idea of what this this divine glory of of universal tradition had descended anyway on on Clovis as the leader of the Franks um, that achieved victory and at that point he had to realize that conversion w was necessary and the story goes that he decided to convert and he came out of his uh, on the balcony of his, of his house, in front of the of the of the Frankish people in arms, as it was tradition of the uh, people army at the time, and he proclaimed that they had to convert. And allegedly, the Franks were converted like that to Catholicism. In practice, we know that the Franks took ages before converting to a decent level of Christianity. I mean, it's it's basically not until Charlemagne and his ecclesiastical reforms that you know that this thing fully. Uh, took uh, a concrete shape, but the important there was the elite was uh, over having o managed to overload the the monarch with this sacral force with this enormous and substantial support from the over disgustingly rich Gallo Roman elites that backed enormously this uh, conversion and integration of the Franks. And, and in fact, if you see the, the 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 major bulk of the Franks, and even properly the, from an ethnographic point of view, that the Germanic element, right, of Austrasia mostly, that was the real place where people, I mean, to this day, kept speaking Germanic languages, was kept kind of out, eventually, of what was the Merovingian establishment in Gaul, right? And albeit the the kingdom that was established eventually by also taking out internal Frankish resistance. Uh, going on there with the defeat of the Visigoths at Vouillet, securing the southern frontier, etc., even lurking, uh, you know, being interested in, in the Italian situation as the Goths were having some troubles there with their with their Arianism, with Constantinople and the local populations, etc. Eventually, the Franks uh, would kind of accelerate that, would naturally bring, uh, of course, first of all, the Franks closer to Constantinople, because at that point, again, it was just like a, uh, a uh, an enormous crescent that went from 
from Germany then through Italy to Spain that was Aryan slash Pagan and then you had in the Northwest the Merovingian Kingdom or Empire f uh, frankly at that point um, that was Catholic and from the other f in the Southeast Constantinople that was Catholic somebody made exceptions such as the Vandals that were Aryans but they 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 hated so much uh, the the Ostrogothic gods because Theodoric had ransomed Sicily uh, from from their domination that they preferred to to stick with the, with the Byzantines up until the same actually took him out right um, to use Africa like a uh, the strategic base to launch the the invasion of, of Sicily and Italy later on um, but fundamentally the the marriage of the Merovingian dynasty and establishment with the Gallo-Roman elites was sanctioned by Clovis baptism and conversion. So this thing took, uh, you see, if this had not happened, if this simple choice of converting to Catholicism had not happened, there would have not been a Frankish kingdom, right? It would have been just something like the Anglo-Saxons, like all different uh, kings always quarreling among each other, you can argue that the, the Merovingians did the same, but they did it from the standpoint that there were the Merovingian bloodline. So that nobody, after Clovis, ever put in discussion the fact that there was a kingdom ruled by a lineage, by a family. The entire land that was taken over in these areas was, in spite of the political compromises, conceived as a private possession of the Merovingian family, not of the Frankish people. The Frankish people were like a token at that point, where something, um, again, the, 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 the Germanic kind of hardcore was concentrated out, still on the fringes of Gaul. Uh, some settled, there's no doubt, there is, but as you know, even just obviously speaking, people there speak Romance, because the majority of people were, were uh, speaking that language anyway. They were too many compared to the Franks, and also Latin was the language of culture, so Again, without that, you couldn't have an administration, you couldn't have a propaganda, you couldn't have a monarchy, you couldn't have a court, you couldn't rule the cities, right? And, and so this was a, a radical change in European history. You can only imagine what it would, I mean, you can only imagine what would, would have happened if this step hadn't been taken. Or even just if, I don't know, Clovis had been defeated at Tolbiac. Maybe we were talking about the Alemannic Empire at this point, uh, or something else. Or maybe the Visigoths would have strengthened their power in Gaul. Who knows, right, what, how things would have gone. Because at that point, everything was really very fluid, right? This was the last moment uh, in which also these peoples, pretty much everywhere in Europe and the Mediterranean, could afford uh, massive campaigns, kind of the perpetuation of what had been mostly the size of, you know, Roman imperial expeditions, eventually with Justinian's plague, etc. Th this thing, but also because of the same wars that were waged in the process that exhausted the lands in many ways, um, brought to, again, these uh, powers from essentially late antique to early medieval potential, that is, again, armies, I mean, campaigns that pass from armies of 30,000 men to uh, hunting parties, right, in size, and destined just to kill, basically, uh, in Merovingian goal, at least, your your brother's children, because essentially those were the, the ones who would have inherited the land anyway. And so you have this ferocious um, clash among the same kins that, you, in fact, you don't find anywhere else in Europe, right? You find levels of violence that are surely comparable, but this idea that, you know, Merovingian uh, children would be taken and, you know, their heads smashed on rocks just because they were the children of, of that guy who had ambitions, who had, you know, received that portion of your father's uh, inheritance and against whom you had to fight, essentially your own brother, uh, was, was a huge deal in the entire Merovingian history because it was about their blood, right? The Merovingians, have said it many times, created a true and proper hematophilic um, uh, ideology for which blood was the source of power, life, eternal glory, um, and responded both to the, uh, in fact, to the, to the Germanic, uh, the primitive northwestern Germanic um, bloodthirstiness and their human sacrifices that they kept 
doing even after Christianization, etc. And the uh, intense uh, Christian uh, uh, emphasis on passion of the Christ, on the suffering of the flesh. Uh, and uh, as you know, also in Frankish girl, this uh, these two elements would mix because eventually the we have a, a Gallo-Roman Frankish empire that is all one, that blends the that level of important, you know, as we've seen, um, levels of, um, especially of private power, because of the estates, etc. With, uh, and so the life, uh, kind of a more, you know, more civilized lifestyle, right? Gold was um, still having an important intellectual movement in this, this point. Um, but, Prevalently, the um, the Frankish warlikeness and military lifestyle that, in fact, also the Gallo-Roman bishops adopted, not just the the Frankish counts that were that were there. So, um, it's a crude story in many ways because it was literally was an establishment created in blood, and again, it must create it blood if if you really want to make it work, especially in those times. And sometimes there are not really alternatives and this was achieved effectively f for the action of one man again if Clovis had died just at the first battle of Soissons we would have never probably even cared about him it would have just one of the many Frankish chieftains uh, Reguli as we're called that uh, were out there and we would have cared this guy changed the whole game for Europe and the world to come because effectively France, as we were saying before, maintained this dramatic, um, also Caesar papistic idea, right? Clovis as the major lord of the land. There is an equation there with the lord, of course, uh, of, he of heaven. Um, there is the famous episode of the vase of Soissons that kind of everybody knows it, but I like to, to repeat it uh, because it's, it's very exemplificative. Uh, after the battle of Soissons, there was as we were saying before, still like an indecision about converting to Christianity. And so Clovis actually let his uh, retinues ravaging Gaul uh, that had remained without army. And they pillaged the surrounding of Soissons, did the same, the same cities, but the ecclesiastical possessions. And Saint Remy, Saint Remigius, would, would baptize Clovis himself. That's, you know, the, the world mystics of the French monarchy from there on, etc. The the baptism, the the holy anointing, etc. It was a, a Jewish and Germanic tradition and brought together again in this in this hybrid. Went to Clovis. Bishops of the ones of Gaul, as you know, there were people with gods. They had stood. Uh, I don't know. Uh, withstood the the Hunnic sieges. There were men of. of of peace but also of war right and they knew what what it, the deal was like and he went to Clovis and he said that was obviously a diplomatic thing right and of course the story is a bit embellished and who knows whether it actually happened but it, I want to believe it did because it does correspond beautifully to, to what eventually happened um, he went to Clovis and said you know there is this vase that uh, it's particularly important it's sacred so if, if if we know that your men have looted it, right? So if you when you distribute the loot among your your men, uh, if you find this vase, please give it back to me because it's important. It's important for the church. And this put Clovis in front of an important choice because in in the Germanic mindset, yes, the leader was everything. This fanatic loyalty, this idea that he was the hero, etc. But it, at the same time, he could always be taken away. I mean, if there was um, taken out, because if somebody was better than him, and all the warriors, as Tacitus said about the Germans, uh, were meant to do exactly as much as uh, their leader did in combat not to be considered less of the not of men but properly of devotees of the of the religious military war uh, in fact bands that that en entailed a kind of uh, death and rebirth in a transfigured 
uh, holy fashion that is at the root of the same chivalry and so on, um, were provided, in fact, themselves with that degree of imperium for which, yes, they derived that imperium through the, their leader that acted as a sort of medium with God. But at the same time, that imperium was theirs. So the loot, given also that these were dramatically miserable times from a material point of view, that these people essentially wanted the loot uh, and, uh, or the land if they were to settle permanently, uh, claimed their own share, like they saw, they saw that as like untouchable. So asserting a greater authority over his, his war bands was essentially the demand that the same Saint-Rémy made to Clovis. That is to say, look, that you can become more than just a primus inter pares, than just a freeman provided with some extra power. You can become literally the, the gods chosen and to rule over the land. You have the greatest imperium. So Clovis thought about this. And and when the the loot share happened, Clovis stood uh, up and said, if someone finds this vase, um, I must have it. I, I will take it. For the rest, well, the loot will be shared mm, proportionally according to your deeds. But that vase is mine. So that meant, literally, also given that the loot was kind of redistributed in a way, because it's not that the single, yeah, this would happen. I mean, the single, the single warrior would take part of the loot. Um, these were also probably not shared just among all the people that they were shared among the the various clan leaders and things like this. So people that had some kind of fact of sense of themselves, of responsibility, also in front of their retinues. And so they, they saw, like, why? Who are you uh, to, to ask this? But nobody would have the courage of doing it because Clovis was, just as his name was, a renowned warrior. And somebody who really had a, a great wisdom as the, the Germanic leaders and the, the entire Indo-European mythology, all the great leaders and the Imperium detainers must have because they're not just strong, uh, powerful warriors. They're intelligent people which is actually makes the difference between people and sub-people, right? And so, and between who can rule and who can't. So nobody would dare to say anything except one, one Frankish warrior who actually found the vase and said, yeah, you want this vase? And he took his axe and smashed it in front of everybody. So that was a, you know that pretty bad things are coming. Because it was saying, you know, if we start with this, we know what, what you, you want to do. You want to step above us, over us. And um, we will not let you do it. Clovis remained cold, motionless. The loot was shared. The vase was destroyed. Um, the story goes that it took, uh, like for one year, nothing happened. After this time, one day Clovis um, went to that warrior, stood in front of him, took the warrior's axe out of the belt of his of the man and threw it on the ground. Now. The axe, the sword, here, it's not, maybe we think about the Francisca, but Francisca was not actually even a Frank, not even a, a, a markedly Germanic weapon. Actually, we think as the Danish axe that this stuff was mostly something coming from the West. In case of the Francisca, actually from an axe used by the, the Roman military. In the case of the Danish axe, actually from a Frankish axe. And because they had to deal with armor, more generally speaking. But it w the, the weapon was the symbol of the man. It was the man alter ego, the man virility, uh, public status, military force. They thought literally there was a, the, the force of, the, the physical and moral force of the man within the weapon. So you go to, to a guy, you, you took away his weapon, you throw it on the ground. It means 
you're not a man. Not you're not a man, you're, you're, you don't exist. This guy kneeled to recover his axe. Clovis took his own axe and split the guy's head open in front of everybody. Uh, and he said, just like you did with the vase of Soissons. And the story goes that also that Clovis had brought the, uh, the fragments of the vase to Saint-Rémy in act of reverence towards the church, towards this new, towards the lords of the land that he, he would have uh, com commanded on. And this, this story is beautiful because it shows that as you, as, as a man cannot fundamentally touch what it's God's, as the utmost power must have the highest reverence for it, so the secular order has to be maintained from the within for which the leader the absolute leader that is meant to be the universal one of the world the imperial detainer cannot be opposed ever and clovis simply proved it by slaughtering that guy in front of everybody and that's that was ferocious by the way it's beautiful because it gave one year for the guy to surely kind of freak out to 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 stew in his own um in his own juice let's say um and because of fear but the most important thing is that clovis equated his power on earth to the one of god so this is the entire Caesar papistic mentality that the Frankish, later French rulers, think about Philip IV, literally said, I'm the head of the church and I'm, and I'm the imperium holder, right? While the, the whole Roman Empire was basically degraded. Because they thought they were really the chosen ones. This is the crucial aspect of the entire Frankish history that the Franks, in general, the Germans, like the Romans, they, they had really never f felt inferior to anybody but this is exactly the point the jews the romans and the franks were the chosen people that were sure about the fact that they would have conquered the world and, and there was nothing that could possibly go in the other direction um, there was a universal aim of rule and this was exemplified by the entire Merovingian propaganda, by the, the, the idea that, of course, God had conferred this power because, through wisdom, Clovis had understood how to rule over this greater land, the, uh, the establishment of which had accepted to, to cooperate with for, actually for the benefit of the entire land at that point, because the Merovingians came to rule over other peoples, right? So, that were lorded on like the, the Aquitanians slash the, the Visigoths at that point the Burgundians, the Alemanni, the Turingi etc even the Anglo-Saxons were client states across the channel etc I mean it was a, the, the greatest power in the West so just think about those elites that had backed Clovis just how much they benefited in the process in the first place and this is really how Frankish power was founded, to become eventually the model of the entire Western world, fundamentally through Frankish feudalism, into all the lands, first in Western Central Europe, then the Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, everywhere. This thing went even uh, across, you know, even Islam in part was Frankicized in feudal terms. And it all began because the Franks managed since Clovis, to maintain the establishment that the Gallo-Romans uh, managed to preserve over the centuries and to make great part of the same Roman power actually flow into that. And this is a very material thing as well. As we often say, the Romans had structured very well their estates uh, across, um, you know, um, uh, the Gallia Belgica, right, to, to back the 
the army of the Rhine. That didn't exist anymore, but Latifundi existed still. The, the Franks seized it. Um, the same, the same cities, the same part of the Roman units, uh, even Roman artillery. We see them used by the Franks against the Visigoths in the more urbanized southern Gaul. And there is a lot of that that makes you understand it was the same Gallo-Roman tradition now commanded by the Franks living on and melting what eventually we know as French culture in many ways. And, and this marked um, monarchic bias is, uh, is actually still alive. I mean, even after the French Revolution, that again destroyed tradition, but still maintained that traditional unity that the French monarchy had conferred to the country to make it, you know, essentially the hegemonic power in, in continental Europe. Um, in its military tradition, and still today, the idea that France is as above everything else, uh, the French president is essentially the uh, the um, the world leader that has the greatest power within his own country. In, in practice, uh, in, from an institutional point of view, um, the um, the enormity also of the military potential and the foreign interventionism, it all started with Clovis, and it's impossible to deny. Right? It may be a coincidence because, of course, again, history could go in very different directions in many ways. We don't have to give for granted the Carolingian Empire. We don't have to give for granted the French Kingdom. But they happened in reality, and if they happened, it's because they were connected one with the other up to Clovis going back. So Clovis' baptism is, um, is really crucial uh, because it managed to achieve the coincidence between these structures of the aristocracy and a uh, an elite, elite cultural tradition that the Franks didn't have and the Clovis created out of itself true blood. In Frankish Gaul, the Catholic Episcopate triumphed well before then Leandrus and Isidore um, of, of Seville tri uh, triumphed in the councils of Toledo in Spain. And this conferred, just chronologically, the, the Properly, the, the power to the Franks that that also allowed uh, Clovis to to dislodge the Visigoths from Aquitaine itself and to make that the rule collapse. And this depended, indeed, from the absence uh, among the Franks of a pre-existing episcopate, like the Visigoths instead had, Germanic and Arian. And therefore, the kind of absence of cultural resistance of uh, of a polit of, of the Merovingian establishment that was essentially substituting to the Roman one in Gaul, leaving also a great part of probably the Germanic element, you know, autonomous in the northeast. When Clovis put an end to Roman domination in northern Gaul, the Franks were still politists. They were intellectually undefended in front of every theological doctrine. They didn't have the means of even opposing one. They just knew that from the other side there was this war that worked quite well, that was rich, was urbanized, they wanted to occupy. Many of them settled in there, living important traces as well. Uh, the same Merovingian, I mean, the same Car up to Carolingian times, up to the 10th century, the Frankish court spoke Germanic. So I'm not diminishing, for example, the, also the ethnic impact. But as we were saying before, there were lots more Romance elements, and the, there w were the ones which eventually the, the Franks blended in, in those territories. And thus, Clovis' conversion between the end of the 5th and the beginning of the 6th century led rapidly to the, com the formal conversion of his people and it represented a meeting point among the uh, pinnacles of Gallo-Roman society and of the most important among the tribal complexes of the Franks. And in this regard it's, it's really important to stress that 
for example, the salient law was codified at the same time. So there was properly a choice made by Clovis to, to integrate also with the, the famous council uh, in gold that he made before his death to properly arrange the land as this structure, right? That wouldn't even contemplate like the Franks as, I don't know, a separate ethnic element from from a political institutional point of view, like the Goths had done in Italy and Spain, who said, no, we are just the army. No, the, the Franks were, were the Franks juridically, because just their identity was expressed juridically from a national point of view, which means that, I don't know, when the Franks settled in the various northern uh, Gallic cities, they they remain for, for, as it happened in the process of Germanization everywhere, for a couple of generations, fundamentally separated, but eventually ma marrying to the local populace, beginning to, to adopt their customs, to speak their language, and so that that ethnic divide was was, was not conceived like as a thing. It was not conceived as a thing, because the Gallo-Romans simply uh, kind of comparticipated to that establishment. They were not kept out of it, were not, um, let's say, um, ostracized, right? They were essentially remaining in, in a condition of power. It was not even um, necessary to cop them, for example, from a military point of view, because indeed the Franks did represent uh, a fresh military force that arrived and put order, by the way. I mean, the, 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 the sources are quite clear about this. The arrival of the Franks had, did put an end to a phase of instability in the land, in the region. Um, this was perceived strongly by the local populations that accepted the Franks as their masters. Right? It was quite important. But at the same time, that they simply kept leaving under, I don't know, the local bishop slash lord that was, yeah, the, was in the city of the bishop and the countryside, uh, the Frankish count, let's say, in the same district, they, they cooperated. Uh, there was trouble, but it was not, uh, I mean, the St. Gregory of Tours tells the stories, quite violent ones. They had to teach the Franks to live in a civilized reality, because they were brutally violent, and, of course, the ecclesiastical perspective doesn't take in consideration lots of important political realities, right? The Frankish counts were not children who just kill each other for, for fun, but um, very often, you know, they, they were not habituated to make things work in a, in a grand style, right? So um, it, took, it took a while, but at the same time, this was a unique people, was a unique rule, and it was so because it was under a monarchy that had managed to surpass any together with the religious element also any kind of problem for example of needing to compact the i don't know those those frankish tribes that i don't know lived for example more far away i mean clovis had become lord of gold what did he care about places like in the far northeast uh, across the rhine that were, well, were important but they could keep their own autonomy they were still franks it would be connected their elites with the uh, with the gallic ones as well and and that uh, kingdom of the Franks was effectively established along the pattern, but there was no need to force hands as long as those um, clans were kind of autonomously obedient, right? And they didn't have any need to to counter their th this greater uh, force that Clovis had managed to to put together battle after battle, victory after victory, as a matter of fact, and managing to consolidate safe grip on uh, essentially, in fact, on Gallia, Belgica, mostly in parts of Burgundy, um, Aquitaine was brought under, but never fully Frankicized, as you know, it was kind of rebellious by nature, but most of the problems would derive from the succession, right, of dynastic succession. But again, that dynasty was one, it was never put in discussion, up to the Pope stepped in to make the Carolingians uh, into power, but that's another thing, still the Frankish establishment lived on, right? What Clovis created was effectively taken on uh, by the, the Carolingians themselves, right? Because everything the Carolingians had basically was identical to the Merovingians, except for probably the imperial title. The St. Clovis would have enjoyed very much, given that he made everything to get everything he got from, um, from Constantinople, the vicary of, of, of the Gauls, 
um, he searched for every possible kind of uh, ideological legitimization for his power, and he managed that, right? This, this ideological dimension was crucial, right? It was powerfully backed by all these cultured bishops uh, of Roman gold that, that s quite powerfully supported his rule uh, in exchange of their, of their own political prestige. And this is more or less the, the, the thing to keep in mind. Uh, in my opinion, crucially, if one wants to understand the Franks, this is the, the most important element. And so the more I study this um, aspect, the more um, I realize how effectively the passage from the Roman to the Germanic domination was just essentially a, uh, a government switch and nothing else, right? It, w it wasn't like a dramatic, brutal um, assimilation uh, due to just mere blackmail, etc. There were crude times. The settlement wasn't easy in general. Uh, but the two sides immediately began to cooperate. And effectively, a great part of the lands remained the ones that had always been. But then changes occurred also for for other reasons that uh, also went with uh, uh, you know with unpredictable events like the pandemic, like also well the general effort that was done to to consolidate this power, um, indeed, um, but um, it it started from with the right foot in the in the Merovingian case and it facilitated dramatically the rise. Um, of, uh, in fact, of the Frankish Empire in Europe as the major Western power, right? And it uh, it was um, uh, it was incredible if you think about that. I mean, even just how quick it was in Claudius' lifetime, they did just the territorial expansion of it, and the Franks were really about uh, war, right? Enough to they know how to keep things together, which must be a thing for a civilization. A civilization must know how to make war, otherwise it's uh, it's done for, right? Um, so for today, we stop it here. I just hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time. Bye.